Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. So, uh, this book is a book that I had read umpty squillion years ago, wasn't even sure I could find again, and was thinking possibly even that it would have just gone out of print because these things happen even if this is an L.M. Montgomery collection. Um, but this is a L. Lucy Maud Montgomery collection, so it did not, in fact, wholly go out of print. Uh, the, now, most of us know who Montgomery is. She's the author who wrote Anne of Green Gables and Emily of New Moon and a bunch of other books that are not in the Anne and Emily series. This, however, is a collection that was compiled by this, uh, Ray Wilm uh, Wilmshurst, and the... What this is, is a collection of short stories that, from various magazines that uh, were published between 1900 and 1933, to give the full range. Uh, the oldest of these, was, the youngest of these was 1933, the next one was 1911. Everything else is mostly within a range of 1903 to 1907. And this is Tales of Other Orphans, and what you have in this book is a collection of stories about, well, in effect, orphans. Um, now, it's not all children in orphanages. In point of fact, there is only one child in an orphanage in this book. But it's about children who do not have caring guardians. Uh, the first child in the... the first orphan in this book... Charlotte is, in fact, she does technically have a father, but he is a father who is clearly uniquely ill-suited to being a father because he has dropped her off with some relatives and gone to climb mountains out west because he would rather climb mountains than care for his daughter. Um... I mean, his wife is dead, and his daughter d therefore needs someone to take care of her who will understand how to raise little girls, which traditionally is not a thing men were very good at. Um, at least, you know, at a time and place when the sexes were so... Uh, had such very, very deep striations between what the masculine role was and the feminine role was, a man trying to raise a daughter could have a great deal of trouble because he would not only not understand girls' stuff, he wouldn't even know how to buy dresses, so he would usually need to find somebody female to handle her upbringing because there would just be so many things he would not know. Um, the thing is, though, that uh, this first child... Uh, decides that she doesn't want uh, to live where she's living anymore because she feels like the family that she has been left with, who are, they are technically family members, but they're cousins, they're not, you know, parents or whatever, that first of all, she doesn't like them because they're one of those loud, boisterous, we love everybody, we hug and pinch and squeeze and cuddle, and nobody wants to be alone and nobody wants to be quiet families. And the thing is, while that's often seen as an ideal, little Charlotte doesn't want that. She wants a family where if she decides she wants to just sit quietly, nobody will ask her what's wrong. They will accept that she just wants to sit quietly, that dinner table conversation does not have to be endless and constant and boisterous, but also that she feels like they are doing this out of a sense, with her at least, out of a sense of obligation rather than because they actually like her. So she goes down the road to uh, a woman who one of her cousins has said is Witch Penny, to basically saying, if you're a real witch, can you find me a new mother? Uh, because there's this other girl in my class at school, and she got a new mother, so if she got one, why can't I have one? And Witch Penny sends Charlotte down the road to what turns out to be Charlotte's grandmother, who uh, basically at the end of the story has said, yes, of course, I'll take you in, um, because they fit together so much better. 
so that's the first story. There are, however, other stories. Some of them are about talented youngsters who find somebody who will appreciate their talent and that gets them a home. Uh, there are several stories about people who are leading desperate, horrifically drudging lives in cities who manage to make their way to the country where somebody basically adopts them and takes them in and says, no, you can live here now. Um, you have stories like The Running Away of Chester, and in that story, uh, it's Chester, the story of Chester is an interesting one because he's an eminently smart kid, but he's still a kid, and so... When he gets $4, which, let's be honest, in 1900, 1902, when this particular story was written, $4 could go a very, very, very long way by comparison. Um, and so Chester, Chester, who is mightily abused by the woman who is, you know, his then-legal guardian, uh... Chester decides he's done. He's, you know, he's asked her, can I go to school? You know, I'll work twice as hard, but I can barely read, and I'm so far behind the other boys. And she says, no, you're not allowed to go to school. Um, which is a thing you could get away with at the turn of the last century, because at that point in time, if you couldn't read, that wasn't actually the world's biggest, you know, that wasn't the world's biggest problem. Uh, in terms of your survival. These days we have much higher literacy rates because society has now made it mandatory in how we have constructed things and how so many things require reading. Uh, it's much more mandatory for a person to be able to read than it used to be. But anyways, so she says, I'm not going to let you go to school, and he, it's sort of like that's the final straw, and he runs away with it. Four dollars. Um, the four dollars is money that he has earned working somewhere else, and for the first time they handed him the money instead of sending it to uh, to the woman who is looking after him. And so, for the first time, he has this money that, after all, he did the work and he's earned it in his hand. So he runs away. And upon running away, he finds his way to a small home with two ladies who are looking for, you know, farm assistance. And they take him in and he helps them on the farm. And eventually, however, one of those two ladies, Miss Salome, uh, she, she winds up making him feel really, really guilty for running away. Uh, what's really interesting, of course, is that this particular story has kind of a weird role reversal thing in it where when he first arrives at the home uh miss clementini uh of the other of the two women there doesn't want to take him in and miss salome does but by the end of it miss clementini is like i'm sorry you want to send him back to that creature she's a horrible person and you shouldn't be sending him back you should be keeping him here but miss salome has salome is one of those people who has such strict moral and ethical guidelines in her life that she will follow the letter of the law right down to the end even if even if in the end it is a problematic moral thing that she will still insist on following the letter of the law she's also one of those people who is so very very nice that they can't understand that some people aren't and so when both Chester and Clementini tell her, you know, that woman is terrible. She just doesn't believe them. But anyways, by the end of the book, she has had received proof that this woman is terrible, and they take Chester in. Um, so there's a lot of stories like that. Uh, the one that had stuck out most to me that I had remembered years later and was my impetus for trying to find this book is uh, the story that is appended to this particular picture, um, which is Millicent's Double. And Millicent and Worth are two young women who meet by happenstance and are, in effect, 
they're like twins. They look so very, very similar that people can't tell them apart unless they are standing right next to each other. But it's the kind of thing where one of them has a slightly more aquiline nose and they have different personalities. But if they're dressed, but if you see them far apart, you can't tell which one is which. And so the story goes that they meet and they become very, very good friends. And then one day, Millicent has two parties to go to. And she decides, it has two social obligations, and there's one is a party that she doesn't want to miss, and the other is an incredibly necessary social obligation that this is, these are associates of her father, and she can't not go. And in the end, she convinces her friend Worth, who after all looks exactly like her, to go in her place and just pretend to be her, uh, to go to this meeting with the... Uh, with these family associates, these business associate people who had asked to see her. And when Worth gets back, she is racked with guilt because they think she's Millicent. And Millicent, and she manages to talk Millicent in being, into being racked with guilt. Frankly, I think they were feeling guilty about nothing, but then again, I was not born in... 1884, in the 1880s, uh, eight, late 1870s, and therefore perhaps my view of moral and ethical mores of the period is a little bit off. I personally don't think they should have been racked with guilt, but they are, so they go and confess that Millicent just you know, that they had swapped places and call it a girlish prank, which I don't think it really was. It was an attempt to get out of an obligation she didn't want to go to a thing she did want, which, while a little self-centered, is not in fact a girlish prank. But anyways, that's how they find out that Worth is actually related to one of the people who was at that particular meeting, and Worth is delighted because she finally has a home and, and, you know, people who care about her, and most importantly, she will not have to, you know, struggle with a terrible job that, you know, she hates in order to be able to finish her education. Um, so, there's that. Uh, there are one or two stories which one will look a little askance at, both of which actually are talent-related stories, um, and both of which involve what I feel is an unfortunate uh, discovery by the people who have been caring for somebody all, all along that, oh, I actually do care about them after all. Um, I have a, a big problem with the Jane Lavinia one because there is actually no reason for her aunt to suddenly turn around and make 180 and say, oh, I actually love you and care about you and I'll be nice after all. I don't have much patience with the character turnaround in that, and I don't have much patience for the story of the little girl who gets a famous singer to come to her home by effectively offering to pay her with a very expensive uh, doll because this woman is a collector and she has a doll that this woman would appreciate. Um, and after she sings and proves that she has a talent, all of a sudden her grandmother starts caring about her. And that's one of those, a child's legal guardian should not only care about their child because the child is pretty or talented. Um, so that one I have a bit of a problem with because I feel like somebody who is only appreciated after they prove they're talented is somebody who is also going to be constantly on the verge of no longer being appreciated if they don't go the way their guardian says. But um, otherwise, these are... they're schmaltzy stories. Uh, there's no denying it. Uh, but they're very, very enjoyable, and they are written in Montgomery's usual inimitable style, so, you know, if you like schmaltzy stories with happy endings, eh, this is a good one. Um, so that is basically everything I have to say about this, and I will see you all next week.